See, but there is the question and quality of mercy and grace from God that brings us back. And then how we act when we receive mercy is the question of the day. I'm not a Christian pastor, but if I were, I would tell you a little story. <laughs> in church, they don't have stories. They have stories. But I, I was thumbing through the Bible one day not long ago. And I happened to cross, Minister Tony, the New Testament, the book of Luke. And thumbing through those onion skin pages and admiring the gilt edge, I got down to Luke 15, uh, where the story is told that's so familiar to many of us of the prodigal son. That story is familiar because they had it in Sunday school three, four times before we reached age 16 and was free enough to stop going. So we know the story. But if you recall correctly, there was a family of righteous men and women living in a land of community or a community which was also populated by the righteous. And that family had some sons, one of which was a young, energetic, visionary of a son. And upon learning that he would, on the death of his father, receive a significant sum in inheritance, in inheritance, then he decided to cut a deal for what amounts to an early buyout. Right, right. What he said was, Daddy, look at here. I, I know that this is due to me upon your passing, but I don't really want to wait that long. Right. Is exactly what he said. You were there. He said, give me mine now. Right now. He said, I want to take my money. I'm going down to the bank. Matter of fact, Daddy, have the lawyer cut me a certified check. And he went down and got the certified check. This is the modern version of the Bible. They don't have the words like this in this one, but I'm just going to tell you what we understand. He went down, Brother Minister Tony, took that check and got out of town. Only thing he did before he left, he went down to a car dealer and got him a big body caprice. He blacked out the windows, <laughs> set it up on some 22s. Huh? He, he dubbed it up. He put, the, he put, put, that, put them 16s in the trunk, <laughs> pumping more bounce to the ounce. Huh? He had that thing on some switches and he was, he was rolling. He, he spending his money, you know what I mean? He got fresh to death. Huh? And, you know, he went, he went over to Burton's in the Fox Hills Mall. <laughs> he got all, he, he got, you know, he got sherbet gators and two-piece linen suits. And he, he was ghetto proper. You know what I mean? He got in his ride and rolled out of town. All right, Daddy, Summer Lake. Rolled out. Got into town in a foreign area. And the scripture says he began living a riotous life among a strange people in a foreign land. That riotous life that the prodigal son began living was the kind of life that many of us who have no knowledge of self would live if we had the resources that he had. So we are familiar with him, and when we hear of his tale, we understand it. First thing he did when he got to the foreign land, he went into the pub, the club, the bar. So him, set him up, Joe. Huh? Is everybody else, what they drinking is on me. What I need is three shots of Hennessy. <laughs> he, the prodigal son was partying. The prodigal son hired bands and musicians. and He hired uh, magicians and dancing girls. And he was buying money at the bar, just flowing. And then he got in real trouble because he stopped folding his money the long way. And he ran through that money real fast, brother. And he found himself in a condition that was poor. He found himself, brother, in a foreign land with no job, no money, no way to get back home because he burnt all the bridges that brought him home. And everybody that was used to hang out with him and be his friends didn't have time for him no more. He was like 
Louis Jordan and Bobby Womack. He found out nobody wants you when you're down and out. You don't hear me now. Huh? Once I lived a life of a millionaire, spending my money, honey, oh, I didn't care. Huh? Taking my friends out for a mighty good time. They were drinking that good gin and champagne and wine. Oh, just as soon as my money got low. Couldn't find a friend and I had no place to go. But if I ever get my hands on a dollar again, I believe I hold on till the eagle grin because I found out won't you mm -hmm. when you're down and out that's what happened to the prodigal son that's what happened to him things got so hard for him praise be to Allah things got so hard for him and he began taking the only jobs he could get a little odd labor over here a little menial job over there running there as handyman work till he ended up so low that he was in a pig pen shucking corn and feeding hogs he did that because he had no more money to buy lodging and he had a lean to with a roof eave on it that would keep him out of the rain when it rained at night in the rainy season he started getting dirty his beard got matted fingernails long feet hard and ashy garments messed up and tore up and then the scripture said one day he came to himself and said, I believe I'll go home to my father's house. Y'all all right? I believe I'll go home to my father's house. He didn't know how he was going to do it, sister, because he was in a bad way. He looked a mess, and he had done some wrong things. He had exercised the full throttle gratification of all of his low desires. Everything that came to his mind, he did it. And he wasted his substance in the process. But when he came to himself, he decided, Brother Chester, he was going to get up uh -huh, and go back to his father's house. He didn't know how he was going to do it, so he started practicing what he was going to say to daddy when he got home. He said in his, in his mind, he said, I'm going to pray that he'll accept this. And what I'm going to say to him is, Father, I've sinned against you. And I've sinned before God. And I know that I have no right to return to my former place of priority in the birth order of your inheritance. But if you could just please let me on the grounds of the property. I don't even have to be in the house. I can be down under that weeping willow tree. Uh, down to the bottom of the hill. I could just find a way somewhere to roll and sleep on that moss-covered bank right there, down there by the creek. I'll find a way just to get on the grounds to be close enough to know that I'm allowed on your property, that you forgave me enough to do that. I know you might not want to, but would you please take me back? He was practicing. Got up out of that pig pen and began his long walk home. The walk, he couldn't take no car. He had sold the Caprice. Huh? He, didn't, he, he thought he could keep the Caprice after he sold the rims, but he had to sell the car too. He, got, he found himself walking back home to daddy's house. I want somebody to hear me this morning. He was walking back to his father's house and things were difficult. He found himself, minister, praying that it would rain so that the rain would wash off some of the stench that had accumulated on him, praying that the water from the heavens would allow him to be washed from some of the stain of his sin and rejection of his father so that he might have been able to take the father's mercy and say, Daddy, please, let me back in. And meanwhile, huh, back at the farm where Daddy was at, I'm sure the father was sitting there thinking about his life. He had gotten aged now. He was older and he was sitting there on the porch. You know how it is. Y'all ain't been in California so long, you done forgot the porch. I can see Daddy sitting up on that porch right now in the rocking chair, brother. Huh? With a pair of them big Smith overalls on with the green trim. Huh? And one of them undershirts with three buttons at the top, long sleeve. A pair of them brogan boots. You understand what I'm talking about? Huh? Yeah, just sitting up on that porch, just rocking and thinking about how good God had been to him in his life, 
wondering about his children and praying for their safety and well-being. Because no matter how your children do you, no matter what they do wrong, you love them. Am I right, parents? You love them and you want them to survive. And, and so he was sitting there on that porch rocking, thinking about all how blessed he was with his sons and his daughters and the increase of his land and his properties and how the crop had come in this year. And he got a good rate for it at the market. Things were good for him. And of course he missed his son. But he knew that he was favored by God nevertheless. Little did he know that his son was walking toward him at that time. But if you walk now in some areas of the country, like over there in East Texas, huh? when you come out from the Golden Triangle and start going up there, you get some hills out there in the country before you get the prayer view. Am I right about it? Huh? And then I can see the son walking. Praying, asking dad to accept him. And sure enough, brothers, the daddy's sitting on the porch. There's one thing about parents. No matter how long you've been gone, no matter how you go through changes, a parent always knows his child. Don't the mother know her child? The father know their child? I don't care how long he be gone with his football career, brother Mr. Tony. If brother Khaled come back, you know him, huh? That's my boy. Sure enough, his father sitting on the porch and his son walked up across the hill. He got to the top of the road by that gravel driveway right there by that white picket fence. He got turned that corner by the mailbox and you know where they put that strap out there for the home. He come right around there. Mm -hmm. And the daddy looked. He know he old now. Got arthritis, diabetes. Can't see like he used to. But the way, maybe the way he held his head, the son. Or maybe the way he walked with that little bop or something is still in there. <laughs> but I can see the daddy right now. That looked like Junie. That's Junie. All of a sudden, the diabetes, the arthritis, the rheumatism is forgotten. He throw down the cane, throw down the walker, and start breaking up the road fast as his old legs can carry. He's running up the walkway, and the son sees this figure approaching and then realizes, that's my father, and he knows he's about to get it because of the shame he brought on his family. Look what happened. Now the father runs up. The son stands still. The son braces himself for the worst. The father continues to run at a breakneck speed. The son closes his eyes and anticipates what he will hear. The vitriol, the anger, the righteous indignation of a man whose house he betrayed, of a man whose law he broke, of a man whose substance he squandered in riotous living. The father runs up to the son. And before the son could say anything, the father held his son and kissed him. He said, let me look at you, boy. And the son began going into his practice speech. Father, I have sinned against you and sinned before the Lord. The father says, shh, hush. Like Billy Holiday told him, hush now. Don't explain. He said, you home. Let me look at you, boy. Yeah, yeah, you need a bath. But it's you. You look good, kind of. And uh, I'm glad you're home. And as the son was shamed and crying, the father held him and said, don't cry. Say, you're home. They took two steps toward the house, and the father hollered out. According to the Bible, it says that he told him, kill the fatted calf. That's right. That's right. Hmm? That's right. You know, if this was East Texas, he ain't going to kill no fatted calf. He told him, say, look, we, are, we finna barbecue, y'all. <laughs> Junie home. Throw on about four slabs and beef ribs. Put that special sauce. I got it out in the back. Huh? Dab it up. Give me about 13 of them long watermelons from South Carolina with the green stripe on it. Huh? Tell your mama make me a whole vat of that potato salad. Huh? You don't hear what I'm saying. Fry up a mess of them porgies from out the creek down there. They say, look what we're going to do. We're going to party. Get all the 45 records from upstairs and put them on the stereo box. We finna have a good time. My son has made it home. I'm happy as any father could be. Matter of fact, praise God. Matter of fact, what I want you to do after that, you know what? Tell you what you do. Get the robe huh, of authority and put it on him. Huh? Get the ring 
and the signet hmm, of the power of attorney for the family. Put it on his finger so he can seal documents in wax on behalf of the house where he is the heir. Put the shoes on him that signify he is to walk the road of future progress for our progeny in the name of our ancestors. Matter of fact, dress him up in all of the ceremonial garb that says he is the one that will take us further in the way of this family than we've ever been before. This, my prodigal son, is home. Right then, though, right then, right then, right then, there was a spirit-eating termite. Hmm? Right then, there was an institution destroying boll weevil. Hmm? There were some aphids on the rose of this scriptural blossom. You know what happened? As soon as that happened, the prodigal son, older brother, come walking around from the side porch. See what all the fuss is. He happy, had a good day, finally got that old 53 Chevy pickup running. About to take it up off them blocks down the side. And as soon as he come to tell his dad he had it done, he sees all this fuss taking place. Immediately, hatred rises up in his heart. Listen, listen, Western region. The hatred comes from the fact that he saw himself. Hey, Brother Marvin. He saw himself. Huh? He saw himself as the superior of his brother. And he said to his father, how are you going to make a fuss over him? He just got back from God knows where look at him he look a mess I've been here with you faithfully every single day I've been keeping the law I've been obeying what I'm supposed to do and you ain't never made no fuss over me now when he come back from raising show sure enough saying you want to make a fuss over him and ignore me so you and your son y'all go ahead with that the Bible said he told him no this thy son talking to his father he was trying to put his father and his brother together and take himself out of it. The father didn't even miss a beat. Father was one of them old G's, you know what I mean? He's one of them old school hustlers from way back. He didn't even let the thing bother him, you know what I mean? No, he said, no, this your brother. He just His answer was just as smooth as the request. No, this your brother uh, is back with us and we celebrate his return as a sign of the mercy of God. How many of you have ever received the mercy of God? How many of you been prodigal and wasteful and did some things you ought not have done? But when somebody, when you get back to the mosque, somebody that been in the mosque obeying all the laws all the time want to hate you. Now you should obey the law. You must obey the law. The restrictive law of Islam is our success. We got to have law, but we're happy over the return of one of the sheep who had gotten lost. You don't act like you better than them as soon as they come back struggling on, crawling on all fours, trying to get back to the mosque and breathe a breath of fresh Muslim air. You can, first thing you ask them is not how you feel and glad to be back. First thing you ask them, where you been? You ain't been here. Why you coming here now? Full of hate. Take that hate off and stop being the older brother. You see, the prodigal son was... A sinner. The prodigal son was a sinner. He sinned. He was guilty of sins of the flesh, no doubt. But his sin, which he applied for and received forgiveness for that sin, was a sin of the flesh. His brother's sin was worse because it's a sin of the orientation of mind. It's a sin of the perspective of self-righteous hypocrisy. 